Uh, yeah, moving on, we, we've had other MGs and Rovers as well, and you, Craig, personally have had some, so I'll let you mention some of the other Yeah, well, well, like I said, moving on to the more my stuff, obviously, like I said, I'm a few years younger than these chaps, um, and I didn't get a Rover myself uh, until last year, and uh, last year, and regular viewers to the channel will know which car we're on about, it's the Silver 25 that we featured uh, mm -hmm. on, yeah. which we filmed, yeah. yeah. Um, unfortunately, shortly after uh, filming, uh, the car decided it didn't want to be a car anymore, and the engine let go, unfortunately, and so I had to let the car go. But, nevertheless, brilliant car, mm. thoroughly enjoyed driving it for the time mm. I had it. My dad had that before me, and then I was going to be, yeah, back to me, because we needed a car at the time, and I went for that. Of course, as we touched on in the video, it was one of the last made, yeah. um, the GSI. Um, Really nice spec on the car, full leather, yeah. air conditioning, fantastic. I was impressed by the seats. Yeah. Mm. Well, uh, only 45 uh, seats they put in the last yeah. ones of that. Yeah, yeah you see, I, I liked um, little touches on the dash of change and everything from my 200 and the modern uh, and yeah, and things, things like yeah, that. Yeah. Some nice touches. Um, the yeah. handle's white marble. Yeah. <laughs> 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 it had stuff like factory fitted rear park sensor, which was pretty yeah. good on a small car back in 2000. It was a one-spec car, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. Um, really, really sad to see that going on. I really want to get my hands on another one at some point. It was a fantastic mm -hmm. car. Um, and very comfortable to drive, easy for work. Thoroughly enjoyed driving the car. Um, and it was quite unusual. You did get a few people sort of. Because yeah. the Rovers are, even the more the last ones like that, are now starting to become a bit of a rarity. Well, they are, yeah. I think it was a fence lift as well, wasn't it? It was, yeah. yeah. Um, um, well, hence you, yours was the 25, and uh, mine was the 200. Yeah. Uh, and actually, my Rover 200 was my first ever, out of all the cars I've had, it was my first ever brand new car. Mm -hmm. Not only has it been used or passed yeah. on or whatever, or anything like that, and this was my first opportunity of ever going to a dealership and brand new car. picking a brand new car of what I wanted, and mine was in the Brooklyn's Green. Yeah. Can you see a link that I picked Brooklyn's Green with my last name being Brooklyn? <laughs> and I got the spec of everything I wanted, and. Do you remember what spec was that? Do you know what? Kind of engine it had, maybe. It was only a 1.4. Yeah. Exactly the same as like mm -hmm. Mizzet was. Um, with it being a first brand new car, I had to be also careful with insurance and things like that. Mm -hmm. But I wasn't so fussed about what engine size I got, it was just the fact it was going to be a brand new car. Yeah, and, yeah. yeah, I mean. It was a break from the norm from the first ever cars, was Vauxhalls and things yeah. like that, and cars, I mean, and it was a whole new bag. It was the thing is, different. Though, and, you know, a lot of people. You know, we'll, we'll say, oh, they're all bad engines because of the, you know, the head gasket issues. Mm. And yes, there were issues, and it was all down to penny pinching by uh, British Aerospace, to be fair. Yeah. When the engine was under development, um, and it was all government funded, everything was going progressing nicely, and test engines were great. Mm. But then British Aerospace got involved, the government sold up their shares of British Aerospace, and it's like, okay, no, you can't have this money, you can't have this money, mm. you've got to, you've got to yeah. do what you've got. And the dowels, where you actually line the car, the, the engine, the, the head up to, to the block, they made them nylon. So, because <laughs> you've got this sandwich system, I mean, bear in mind this was the similar sort of system yeah. they were using in Formula One at the time. Yeah. The same designs, and they've got these bolts that come through to the, the oil rail at the bottom, sandwiching the whole thing together. And you've got these bits of nylon that are effectively holding the head in place. Man. I'm sure when the K series first came out, it won awards for its innovation in its Yeah, it did. Yes. Yeah. Bear in mind, in terms of power to to capacity ratio, nobody else matched that until the early two. You see, didn't did they? Obviously, the with the K series engine, it, it it wasn't a poor engine. It was one of the engines you just had to. Maintain one. Maintain properly, yeah. yeah. And if you kept on top of it and had a bit of common sense with it, Cause it was a brilliant engine. I think before when the R8 came out, that it, it won a world attention. It also, it was the first car in its class, I think, to have, um, when it was launched, a complete range of 16 valve engines. Yeah. They didn't make any valve ones later on for mm. more basic models, but... Yeah, the Metro, the me yeah. Yeah, Metro I'm sure... I'm sure it was the first one to, like, say at the time of escorts and Astros mm. and stuff like that, it was the first car in class to have a complete range of 16 mm Well, bench. bear in mind, it was designed initially to be uh, a 1.1 1 .1 and a 1.3, mm. possibly a 1.4. Uh, Those were the engine ranges it was supposed to be, 1 meter 1 to 1.1, 1 1.4. 1 
I think it was. Mm, yeah. And then they expanded it to include 1.6 and 1.8. But didn't the, the 1.6 mm. use a Honda engine? Yeah, well, no, they, you, you got 1.6s eventually. Yeah. Mm. And yeah. 1.8s. And the design changes were minimal. Mm. So it was a very flexible engine. Mm, yeah. And not only was it a flexible engine, like I say, if, if you maintained it properly and looked after it well, mm. it was an incredibly durable engine. Yeah. It was one of those that, once you got it warmed up, it loved to rev. Yeah. It, it did, and this is what I, I found with my NGZ. Uh, uh, again, that was a 1.4. And it was a lovely little pocket rocket the way it mm. revved and everything. It handled a dream. Mm. And when you get when you put the one point eight in the in the ZR, which is one point eight. Well, I, I remember on collection day when I went to get mine and this lad and his girlfriend had got a grey one, like a gold metal grey. Yeah. And he got a five door, mine with a three door and uh, I think his was a bigger engine. Mm. And um, we were collecting at the same time, the same chap that was dealing with me, we were dealing with me half an hour later when I sort of got my head. So we both arrived at the same time and both cars were outside. Uh, and the regs were nearly identical. Mm-hmm. And they were both part of there. She's a girlfriend of this chap's looking at his with him and then they're looking at mine and the, I'm looking at mine and they're looking at his. And we're both waiting to do with paperwork and to collect mm-hmm. the car. Mm-hmm. And it, it was a, a nice moment actually mm-hmm. uh, to collect this MG. It, it really was. Uh, because then at the time, the styling of them ZRs were so out there as well with yeah, the massive spoiler yeah, and the side skirts and everything. You know, I think I still think, and I still I still say this, I still think it looked better as a four door, as a five door than it did as the three. Yeah, yeah you say this, um, but I, I think it does. I'm a bit I of the, the sort of where I prefer three doors in a lot of cars. I think the twenty five, the Rover version, looks better as a five door. I think the MG version, with its more sporty styling, it suits the three door better. I think it can pull it off with both. So I think, yes, you're right, it can. But I just think out of the two, I think the Rover version looks better as a five door and the MG version looks better. The one thing that I think they, they made the biggest mistake on was with, on the facelift, they, uh, they made the MG version look sad. Yes, it, I don't know if Felicity toned it down, but I, I love the, the first ZR with the cross mesh and, yeah, and, and, and yeah, the yeah. mesh, the proper metal, and it wasn't, there were no imitation. Mm-hmm. I, I remember when I first cleaned the car and and you, you pressed that and you could feel it's proper. Yeah. Stainless steel it was proper the real uh, deal. It was, yeah, it was well put. And all the little features I think made the car unique. No, I think the facelift twenty five is probably the best the car has ever looked from the moment it was in, it came out yeah, to the, mm-hmm. the the last generation twenty five is the best looking of the lot. Yeah. But the S- original ZR is the best, the best for the MGs. Yeah. Yeah. The MGT. I think the biggest improvements with the 25 and the ZR um, when they were facelifted was basically on the inside. Yeah, the interior was, um, it was well, it hadn't improved. changed from the no, to no, and the interior was massively improved as Martin mentioned. Mm. Say, and on the video with the sort of Audi TT style, yeah, that's what they reminded me of. And I wish to this day when I had my ZR. With its original looks, if you could have had the interior from then. It was such a small change, but it made such a difference. Yeah. Do you know where they first came in? To a streetwise. No. You, did, you did mention before the streetwise, the street street but it was before, wasn't it? Before the streetwise, it was actually the MGSV. Of course, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. 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 yeah, but it was, it was such a, a, a lovely little car, it had such a character. <laughs> I remember being at a motor show, and it's when obviously MG Rove was still going. And, we were at the stand down in a look, and I entered a competition to win a streetwise, and I was hoping they were going to win it, and it, it was there on this big stand I up and all that, that, I think it was like a silver colour, I'm sure it was, mm-hmm. and we were entering like mad and all that, and posting as entries in this box, and we were all hoping and praying, come on, let's win it, let's win it, and we were putting so many entries in, we were, I, I were dead set, I thought, I'm going to win this, Captain, I've never heard of this thing. <laughs> <laughs> but, okay. Interesting car. Um, so to sum up then, um, well, we'll keep, well, we'll it's a strange little twist because obviously we, we, we sort of mentioned earlier with the Saab, um, we mentioned how things are still trending along. Saab is technically with a lot of Chinese investment still around with the mm-hmm. national electric vehicle of Sweden on NEVS. Mm-hmm. And they're using the 93 yeah. uh, mm-hmm. body shell to build an electric, an all electric car. You don't hear the name, do you? But they're using the body shell on that, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, but not only that, 
MG is still around, again under Chinese ownership. So of course, they've got the new model of yeah. major cars. And the new yeah. MG6, which is stunning, by the way, is due out in this country. Yes, there's the new one coming out, isn't it? Yeah. And yeah, it's fantastic. And the original MG6, it looked okay. The Eurobox... Um, and didn't really sell well. Yeah, I, I saw a couple on the roads, and I actually saw one in it like it's like a copper colour. Yes. And yeah. I actually thought, from a fact, when I saw the car, I thought, you know, it don't look half bad actually. Yeah. This, I, I mean, it's funny. I test drove a couple of MG6s, uh, one of which was that copper colour. Yeah. Um, and when it first came out, I thought, what a really nice looking stylish mm. hatchback that was. And the saloon, of course, it is saloon as well. Mm. Yeah, for a while. The thing that disappointed me was when I got in the car. Yeah. And then the interior. Yeah. The, it wasn't a bad design. The outside, I thought, was very stylish, but the interior, it was the interior quality that let, let right, the right, plastics down. and things. Look, now, here's another thing, though. So we've got NG, they're still around. They're, they're, you know, they're, yeah, they're yeah. Chinese, but they're still around. Some are technically still around under the Nevs brand, mm. as, of, as of the vehicles. But what about Rover? Well... As we know, you can't go and buy a new Rover these days. No. Uh, what is the situation with the brand? Could they, the brand. If, if, if it was um, enough money was pumped into it, could they? Is it physically possible for them to be revived? Yes, because the brand is owned by Tata, who own Land Rover and Range Rover. Well, as we know, they're still thriving, aren't they? Yeah. Um, but the so thing the, is, that's tied into those. So technically, they're still tied in with them. So basically, the Rover brand, in a sense, you could say, is actually still going. Yeah. But here's the strange thing: Tata are planning to launch a car. Right. Do you know what they're going to call it? Go on. The Road Rover. The Road Rover. I'm not so sure about Isn't that. Isn't that just a Rover? As a opposed Rover. to the Land Rover. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Land Rover, Range Rover. Right. Road so you've got your Land Rover. And your Road Rover. And then you've got a Road Rover. Yeah. Is it something, basically, I no. don't like China. So just a normal car. Yeah. Yeah. I don't like China, don't say Rover. Same, do they? Don't no, say Rover. It's the uh, with their name, which, which is... way they had. Yeah, which um, they technically have, that's what they call their cars in China. Yeah. They have Rover cars. Do you um, think Tata's having some issues of pronouncing things I remember? No, I don't so, because wouldn't they then rename Range Rover and Land Rover? True, boy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's... But yeah, technically the Rover brand still exists under Tata. So we've established that the Rover brand is actually still out there in a sense. And, and Rover is still quite well regarded in several territories as well. So mm. it could actually be launched again as a luxury. Well, well this is the thing. I mean, it, it, I think it depends on whether Tata are, are prepared to put the time and money and effort into relaunching the Rover brand. Because I think if they did that, especially in UK and Europe, it wouldn't do half bad. I mean, my, my, my mind goes back to when we were in Portugal a couple of years ago. Mm. And yeah. I, I was astonished to see so many Rovers still on the road. Yeah. Mm. In, 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 and in, when we were in Spain as well. Yeah, that was, that was amazing. You see, what struck me is when MG Rover was, let's say, in the hands of... Uh, BMW? No, not BMW. When, when, was you, no, when it was all going up in the air, in the hands yeah. of receivers and all. Oh, and, yeah. and you didn't know what was going to happen with anything. Uh, a lot of places sold cars off cheaply. Yeah. And I noticed the amount of people that bought ZRs and not lot because they were watching. And I thought... Do you know what? If you'd have had that dedication and actually bought the cars in the first place, it's still be going. How much the company would have still be going? I thought they were just latching on to the unfortunate. I think I think the problem was at the time though. buying a cheap car, and I thought that was a bit sickening to see. I think the problem was at the time though, uh, chaps, was that although there were still decent cars, the twenty-five and the forty-five, they were old. So they were old. Yeah. And mm -hmm. there was no getting away from the fact. As much as I like them and we like them, and yeah, it's true. Like yeah. People want to see a new car every few years. Well, they do. And the problem was, there just wasn't, well, I don't know what, why, but there just wasn't the development there. Well, so, yeah, you know. um, that's another story, and I think we should cover that. Yes. Um, I think that, I, but I that's, just really wish that someone would have actually taken Rover and MG on board and continued with them. Because. Wouldn't it be fantastic for this? I would have loved to see the cars that was coming out now. Yeah. yeah. Because I know they had a lot of ideas. We got a few teasers, like, didn't we, of what, yeah. was, what, was, what was to come. Yeah. Um, but what is it, um, I guess, to, to summarise, what is it about the brand that you like, Malcolm? What was it 
The, why have you got the affiliation? Obviously, we've all owned the cars and no people. Well, we have, yeah. My dad, my dad himself had his own road for 400. I think it was, it's just the fact that you could get so much quality out of what was, what was really very little money by comparison. The SD1 is a brilliant example because it, mm. it was, when it was reviewed and it originally came out, it was compared to the Mercedes and those cars, which were twice the price in some, some yeah, instances. Yeah. And it came off better. And again, with the, with the 75, it, it became a Mercedes basher. And the 75 yeah. proves to be quite flexible. You've got the V8s, for example, with the, with the Mustang. Yeah. They're, they're, they're seriously. Well, you see, what I, I personally liked about the fact you had MG and Rover, it gave you this sort of choice. Personally, like for myself, my dad's the sort that he'd go and he'd say, right, I'll have a 75. But I'd say, I want something a little bit more sporty, but love the 75, I can get the MG version. Yeah, that doesn't that show, that, doesn't that show what the problem was with Rover at the time? Was it like an Achilles heel there? It was an old person's car. It was, well, that was an old person's car. I think that was saw it that way, but... You say that, but you see the ZR was the best selling hot hatchback in Britain right up until it went out of production. It was an MG. But that was MG's. Yeah, 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 yeah. But what I'm saying is, although they were based on, you say, what, like an old no man's car, they were still selling. I think what they should have done uh, was it immediately killed off the Rover brand in the lower segment. Mm. The 75, fine. You've got the 75 there, brilliant. Mm. And you've got the MG equivalent. But certainly the two, the twenty-five should have just become an MG. Yeah. Yes, and, and yeah. Pro- merged them all oh, together. I can see what you mean with it. I mean, because it, it could have been more strength in a smaller number, wouldn't it? Yeah. And they could have survived. So you could have had the MG F mm. or the TF as it became. You could have had the MG ZR. You could have had the crossover, maybe, maybe the forty-five. About yeah. not convinced. I think, I think, I think the forty-five really though should have died. The twenty-five and the forty-five. Yeah. Um, although the ZR and the ZS versions were doing relatively well. The 25 and the 45, in the final sort of days of road, mm. there was no getting away from the fact they just weren't selling. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think, going on to your point there, if that had been implemented, that would have saved them a bit of money. That could have been a game changer, that, yeah. if they would have structurally done that.